Had we lived, I should have had a tale to tell of the hardihood, endurance and courage of my companions, which would have stirred the heart of every Englishman. These rough notes and our dead bodies must tell the tale. There is this sort of curiosity about that unknown. And Scott himself says, I'm going from the known to the unknown. And that is the sort of the driver in the imagination to head across that extraordinary, perilous continent into that great white silence. I think there's something remarkably inspiring about that. I'm Heather Lane, and I'm the librarian and keeper of collections at the Scott Polar Research Institute. The 17th of January marks the centenary of the achievement of the South Pole by Robert Falcon Scott and his four companions. And we're marking the day with a celebration of all that he achieved on that expedition, the amazing amount of science that was carried out, and uh, actually the fact that he was the first Briton to the Pole. As Scott himself said, they actually did manage to achieve what they had set out to do, despite the fact that, in fact, they were beaten to it by the Norwegian team, led by Roald Amundsen, about 35 days earlier. The first clue that Amundsen had actually reached the Pole before them was when they first of all saw um, a flag, a black marker flag, marking one of Amundsen's cairns, one of his depots, uh, in the distance, and the traces of Amundsen's dog team. Obviously, having seen the marker flag, what um, Scott and his companions do is to, to go on and actually try to identify the South Pole, uh, where the pole is. And they spend two days uh, around, in and around the sort of the area of the pole, taking measurements, making sure that they've actually hit the, the exact point of 90 degrees south. Uh, they discover that the, uh, the tent that the Norwegians have left is actually slightly off the track of the pole. Um, but they do find in the tent a letter left by uh, Amundsen, uh, with a request to Scott that he take that letter back to King Haakon of Norway. January the 16th, 1912. The Norwegians have forestalled us and are first at the pole. It is a terrible disappointment and I am very sorry for my loyal companions. Tomorrow we must march onto the pole and then hasten home with all the speed we can compass. All the daydreams must go. It will be a wearisome return. Undoubtedly, it was a a knock to their morale, but they had already travelled well over 800 miles in their quest to get to the South Pole. Uh, There was no reason at that stage to think that they weren't going to make it all the way back. And although they do sort of set off with with rather heavy hearts, and I think Scott expresses it very well um, when he says, you know, how how sorry he feels for his companions, but that they are now looking forward to to going back and actually doing another season of scientific work. I think the the story of the death of Scott and, and the Polar Party is very well known, but the part, I think, that I find most interesting is the way that that uh, message, what actually happened, was conveyed to the British public. The news actually doesn't break in Britain until 1913, after the search party have been out and discovered the tent with the bodies of Scott, Wilson and Bowers, and then sailed back to New Zealand. And the news then breaks. And there is a huge public outpouring of grief and of sympathy for what is seen as this sort of extraordinarily gallant behaviour. Scott I th- really sort of embodies the, um, the sort of British gentleman who has done something heroic for his nation. For four days we have been unable to leave the tent, the gale howling about us. We are weak, writing is difficult, But for my own sake, I do not regret this journey, which has shown that Englishmen can endure hardships, help one another, and meet death with as great a fortitude as ever in the past. We took risks. We knew we took them. 
Things have come out against us and therefore we have no cause for complaint, but bow to the will of Providence, determined still to do our best to the last. The way that the journals convey this sense of calm in the face of death, I think is very powerful. And there is a sense of readiness to face up to what they've done, to face their own responsibilities, the understanding that they really did know what they were going into. They were very well prepared for this journey. They couldn't have known, really, that working at altitude on the polar plateau was going to take such a toll on them physically. There is a real sense of wanting to say goodbye to their friends, to their families, before it's too late, but also wanting to make sure that everybody understood that they really had done all they could to survive. And going out, going out together, I think, was actually very important to them. We try to explore through displaying the manuscripts in the collection here uh, the many aspects of three years of expedition life. And I think it's important for us to remember how Scott's last plea in his journal, for God's sake look after our people, actually triggered the setting up of the Mansion House Fund which led in due course to the foundation of the Scott Polar Research Institute and actually allowed us to take Scott's example um, as somebody who was deeply interested in science to really inspire a new generation. We've had a hundred years of really successful uh, scientific endeavour in the polar regions and we're looking forward very much to really being there to support people, researchers, scientists, scholars and school children through another hundred years, uh, inspired by the message of Scott. <laughs>